Hey everyone, welcome back to a new malicious compliance video. I hope you had a great day. The first story is called, he wanted to use the biggest bill. This is a story from when I was a manager at a coffee shop. We usually have a little change in the register as most customers pay with credit cards. Especially in the morning we will have very little change. In my country we have the right to deny the use of larger bills if we cannot give change back or if it will be a huge liability for the business to accept it. I had a customer come in the early hours and order a small black coffee. He then proceeded to hand me the largest bill we have. I could see he had a ton of lower bills and his card as he was picking this bill from a pile of lower bills. He demanded that it was his right to pay with this bill. I told him in my best customer service voice that it would be impossible for me to accept the bill as I wouldn't have any change left in the register. He was adamant and stood his ground. This is a usual technique used by some people in hopes that I will just say screw it and give them the coffee for free. This wasn't the first time this customer had done this either. I told him I would have to go to the exchange automat at the mall we were in and change it. He sounded annoyed but accepted that. What he didn't know is that in the early hours almost every shop in the mall is at this automat to exchange their bills to have enough change for the day. I spent 20 minutes in a line before I got his change. This dude waited a total of almost 30 minutes for a cup of coffee because he decided to use his biggest bill and refused to pay otherwise. The next story is called Learning a Lesson the Hard Way. I practiced law for a number of years at the same firm. The firm had this policy where all the attorneys and partners down to the junior associates would have lunch together on Fridays. And there would be a presentation of the cases that had been recently decided in the area of law that we practiced. Prior to my arrival only the junior associates and not the partners gave this presentation. But that had changed so that both a partner and an associate would now give the presentation. There were enough attorneys in the firm that your turn would come up once a year. And it was a fair amount of work to put together the presentation for the Friday lunch. I got paired with a newly made partner for my very first presentation. He was very disgruntled about having to do the presentation as he was now a partner and he thought he shouldn't have to do them anymore. He decided to not prepare any of the cases and told me that I was to do that and he would be there to answer any questions that came up. Being junior I didn't say anything but went ahead and prepared the cases and gave the presentation. After I had summarized the first case, one of the attorneys in the room asked a very detailed technical question about the case. I responded by turning to the partner and saying, I don't know, perhaps the partner can answer that, which is what I did with all of the questions I was asked that day. Naturally, the partner had not read any of the cases. So he couldn't coherently answer any of the questions. He wasn't well liked by the other attorneys in the room who quickly figured out that he had me do all the work for the presentation while he did nothing. So they began asking more and more complex questions to which I would turn to him for an answer. By the end of the lunch he was beat red. Going forward he did his share of the presentations in the future. The third story is called Tamper. My immediate supervisor, let's call him Daryl, is an all around jerk. Our receptionist, let's call her Betsy, got yelled at from Daryl one afternoon. Apparently Daryl asked Betsy to forward every piece of communication from company XYZ to his mailbox. He had forgotten his cell phone at home and had no way to access his email. This was made clear only after the events that unfolded later that day. We have physical, cubby style mailboxes that no one, Daryl included, ever use for intra office or inter office communication. I have reference books in mine, others stuff their coats or hats in theirs. Our company tries to be as paperless as possible. There's an edict from upper management that, if possible, messages and documents are to be forwarded via email. Betsy, as per usual, forwards the docs from company XYZ to Daryl's email inbox like she had done a million other times. Daryl blew a gasket when the intern that he sent to the office for various other reasons met him back at the job site saying he had nothing in his mailbox. Late in the day he got us all of his subordinates, including Betsy, who technically isn't part of his support staff. He whips her apart in front of all of us. He says to Betsy, I said mailbox, not email inbox. A six year old knows the difference between the two. Betsy tries to reason that Daryl should have notified her about his phone being left at home. 
Daryl's forehead reins are throbbing at this point and he's speed wet. He says, and I'm paraphrasing, I don't need to give any of you unnecessary information. You just follow my directions verbatim. When I say red, I don't mean maroon. When I say non-fat milk, I don't mean low-fat milk. He went on and on with other examples. Betsy was crushed and naturally humiliated. One of my duties is to coordinate travel and accommodations for our team whenever any of us have to travel to meet clients. I already had concrete plans to relocate to a different state and was planning to give HR my two-week notice in about a week or two. I thought I'd give all Daryl a parting gift, some malicious compliance. I overheard him talking on his phone one morning that he's meeting fellow KC Chiefs fans in Tampa to watch the Super Bowl in Tampa. He scheduled a client visit in Tampa conveniently on the Friday before the Super Bowl. He verbally tells me to book a hotel that's nearest to the middle of Tampa Bay and he wants his final connecting flight to land in Tampa Bay Airport. I said, you got it chief. I smugly asked, do you want your itinerary and confirmation in your mailbox or your email inbox? He looks at me like I'm something sticky that got stuck at the bottom of his shoes. You saw me talking to someone using my cell phone, didn't you? I sure did. So, mailbox or email inbox? He screams email and then storms out. The next day, I forward his hotel booking and flight details to his email, mentioning in all caps, closest to the middle of Tampa Bay. Remember, email is monitored, so the higher ups, legal department and HR has easy access to our paper trail. I asked him to please respond back via email that the itinerary is satisfactory to him. I get a response email saying, that's what I said. He is now booked to fly from Chicago to Tampa Bay, the body of water, not Tampa the city, via a national airline. It lands in St. Pete Clearwater Airport with a connecting flight, a local seaplane that will take him from St. Pete to Tampa Bay Harbor. His waterfront hotel, of course, is the closest to the middle of the bay, a good 20 to 25 miles to the middle of downtown Tampa. I had four days left when he came back to the office the Tuesday after the Super Bowl. He didn't acknowledge me whatsoever, didn't make eye contact, didn't delegate any task for me at all. I was told by my teammates, whom I remained in contact with, that Daryl mellowed out over the several weeks after my departure, even going as far as personally apologizing to Betsy in front of them. Betsy got promoted to my old position, Daryl gave her a glowing review, believe it or not. The last story is called Strict Compliance. I worked for a major government contractor for a government agency. I'd risen up through the ranks because I have good technical knowledge and I have a knack for seeing a big picture view of big projects and seeing potential problems. I was very good at what I did. Many managers didn't like me because I pointed out problem areas with over 75% accuracy and I stated facts without regards for management politics. Some managers gave Fair Haired Boy a suck up credit for my work, which I'd done before Fair Haired Boy was even working on the project. Then they desperately needed my technical expertise on a very large procurement, 8 digits. I wrote most of the technical specifications, identifying risk areas and the consequences of bad procurement decisions. Fair Haired Boy dismissed my arguments as no big deal and we can work around that. So management ignored me and ended up buying inadequate equipment. I was reassigned, again, and Fairhead Boy was given what should have been my job, with a promotion and big raise. My parting gift to the project managers was a detailed memo highlighting every technical problem that I foresaw in that development and how it could be avoided. It was a very long list of nearly 100 watch items and they ended up hitting almost all of them. As usual, management ignored me. Due to company rules and a lot of prior excellent personal performance reviews, management couldn't fire me immediately. But I could tell I was being set up for termination. I was assigned a job to work directly with the customer as a liaison, actually sitting on the customer side. Management figured I'd be an irritant and distract the customer from the company's issues. In the meantime, I'd keep our company informed about what the customer was saying behind closed doors and I was supposed to tell the customer what management wanted me to say was happening in the company. Management intended it to be a do-nothing job to keep me out of sight, out of mind. I don't do do-nothing jobs, I took it seriously. 
But after a couple of months, management told me in no uncertain terms that I was not permitted to answer the customer's questions about what was going on inside the company on the project. And that I was not permitted to talk at internal company meetings where the customer's needs were being discussed. I was muzzled and set up for failure. Or so they thought. Now comes the malicious compliance that ended up with revenge. When asked by the customer, instead of X or Y is happening, my response were pretty much like I am not permitted to tell you whether the project is significantly over budget. And management won't let me tell you whether or not the company is dropping design requirements for features A and B. I explicitly complied with management directive of not answering the customer's questions. But I slipped in enough hints in my non-answers that the customer knew where to look and what questions to ask. The customer also kept meeting minutes and often recordings. This always reflected that I did not answer questions about the subject under discussion, which was technically the truth. Eventually, management couldn't hide that the project was way late and way over budget, which didn't surprise the customer, thanks to my hints. The customer ripped the company a new one in their periodic contract performance review. In government contracts, it's very difficult to get a low performance score. Really difficult. But the company got a very low performance score. It was ugly and the company lost a lot of contract bonuses, which would have been a big part of profits and management bonuses. And Fairhead Boy was under such stress trying to solve the problems that I'd warned him about that he had a major heart attack and retired from medical disability at the age of 42. Naturally, management wanted me to be the scapegoat. So they'd get to fire me, but the customer liked how I worked. And they protected me with very careful language in the performance appraisal. They basically said that the task I was doing was the only task in the company that was performing effectively and everything else thanks to high heaven. Upper management didn't dare fire me or they'd anger the customer even more than they already had. Possibly to the point of having the contract taken away for non-performance. One particularly nasty manager who really hated me had to give me a significant pay raise and bonus because of my work. The fallout from the review was bad enough that corporate headquarters did some management shuffling and a few of my antagonists were suddenly gone. The race and promotion ended up not mattering because the customer hired me directly working on the same project but on the government side. This caused management to grab their pants because I knew all their dirty secrets and tricks. But I never ratted on any of the managers or company dirty laundry. I didn't have to. My new co-workers had previously figured out where to focus their attention and what questions to ask to get past the company secrets. I complied strictly with the terms of my separation from the company and gave away no secrets after I left the company. One of the best parts was that in meetings all I had to do was put on an evil grin and the company managers would be fearful, wondering if I was going to unearth one of the skeletons. I never did, I just liked watching them squirm. They got paranoid about being caught trying to lie to the government that they were admitting bad news up front. Because of bad performance, the management admitted it got even worse for the company. They decided to try letting their legal hounds on me for violating company non-disclosure agreements. But the customer's meeting minutes proved that I hadn't. The contract was restructured to eliminate several blind spots the company had used to their advantage. The customer's oversight of the company rose significantly. Profit margins on the contract shrank. Several of management's favorite employees suddenly had resumes on the street because their protection was disappearing. Even more managers retired or found other jobs. It was glorious to watch, doubly so because I let them do it to themselves. And I was extremely happy in my new job, where I still work. Thanks for watching the video, I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope you have a great day, stay safe, bye bye.